Great. So my name is Steven. I'll be presenting the solution that we came up with. Just please know that everybody here worked equally hard, and I brought pastries to our, some of our weekly meetings. So it really is a pleasure to be here. You know, we had to give this presentation a couple of weeks ago to a portion of the student body at Hebrew U in Jerusalem, and that was coercion on the part of the deans. But to be here with a gala dinner tonight and a fully stocked mini bar hotel paid for by university, it really is a pleasure. So these are the team members. Unfortunately, Angelina couldn't be here tonight. We don't have the opportunity to introduce everybody personally, but hopefully at the networking events, you'll have the opportunity to meet them. Uh, please know that should you ever come to Israel, please feel free to drive like diplomats because Adina works very closely with the Israel Traffic Police so she can you know, take care of all your ticketing needs. So this is what we'll be going through in the next couple of minutes, how we approach a problem, some results and sensitivity analyses, the next step which we'd like to take with our approach, and then some appendix, should you have any questions. We have some extra slides prepared. So why are we here? So ultimately, we were able to achieve a return of 25 percentage points above the S&P 500 with a higher Sharpe ratio, signifying that our uh, risk was justified. We were able to do this with the alpha provided to us by Informs, which we'll call the original alpha as well. We took a text mining approach, and we were able to beat the S&P 500 as well using this text mining alpha that we call, which we'll explain a little bit later. So how did we go about this problem? So this is the objective as we were given with the risk and the expected return. And my background is agriculture. So I think last year's perhaps competition would have been a little bit more appropriate as well as in Vegas. But whatever, Baltimore, such is life. It's all about timing. Anyway, so I'm uh, from agriculture, so like finance, right? What do I know? So I'm like, OK, I'll go to the literature. And I saw that two of America's favorite literary characters had actually attempted to solve this problem decades ago. But building a time machine was not that easy. So we had to approach this from a more traditional standpoint. So we took a look at the problem a little bit more in depth. And we saw that, again, many of the constraints were linear. So we could solve this fairly easily using quadratic programming. Not that difficult. However, principle kind of threw us a curveball, introduced some nonlinear constraints, which we had to deal with. So what our great advisors at Hebrew University, Nicole Adler, Lev Muchnik, Shiki Levy, amongst others, they had us take a look at you know, some finance literature and some portfolio optimization and optimization in general. And the students, we divided some papers amongst us. We read them, and we introduce the different approaches to each other. And we decided that we would like to take a genetic algorithm approach. It was interesting, it was novel, and it was implementable as well. So I'll introduce genetic algorithms a little bit here in case somebody is not familiar. So one of the advantages is are that they can be used for nonlinear problems. Obviously, otherwise we wouldn't have used it. They can use parallel processing. So in terms of a computer, it can use multiple cores, which is important given that we only had three minutes per four week time period. And as well, they're widely used in optimization problems. Some of the disadvantages of genetic algorithms are is that the initiation point is crucial. So where you start from is very important. Just if you would like to have blonde haired, blue eyed children, you're much more likely to get that result if you have perhaps Scandinavian parents as opposed to perhaps Hispanic or Asian. That's just a fact. As well, sometimes there are unwanted random mutations. So you can have two perfectly health, uh, healthy parents, but unfortunately, just one small mutation in DNA can lead to a child with, unfortunately, cystic fibrosis, for example. So these two disadvantages up here can lead you in directions in the problem solution space that you don't want to go to, and therefore, you kind of have to uh, take a longer computational area to get to that minimization objective. So this is a quick schematic of what a genetic algorithm is. You start off here with a population of people or a population of portfolios. Uh, they pair up. This is really important to Jewish parents in Israel. Um, the parents open up a bottle of wine. They exchange genetic material, for a lack of a better word. And they have children. And this kind of goes on and on and on until you terminate. So from a biological perspective, termination could be, let's say, an asteroid hitting Earth and destroying all the dinosaurs. But for us, termination was, again, that three-minute time period for each four-week uh, period. And what we were able to do for our algorithm is run the algorithm 45 times per iteration, per uh, three minutes time allotment that we were given. Uh, so we had 45 opportunities to reach the fittest portfolio. Now, we mentioned that random mutations are a limitation of genetic algorithms. So we had to take this into account. So what we did is, 
this is the linear constraints, and you would expect the optimal solution well, would be at one of the vertices, and then we introduce the nonlinear constraints, and that kind of messes things up. And here on the contour map, one of the, 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 the solutions would be at either a min or a max, depending on your objective function. However, again, these random mutations could lead us to have a solution outside of the constraints. This is not what principal wants and not what we were asked for in the problem statement. So we introduced a distance penalty to force us back our genetic algorithm to operate within the constraints of the problem. So we rewrote our objective function in order to take into account some of the limitations of the genetic algorithm. And as well, we took into account the transaction cost. So we mentioned that parents are important. And again, if you have a random parent, so you can kind of start up here. And because this is a minimization, we want to get down here. So again, the computational times and the trajectory that you have to traverse, would uh, you could unlikely get to that minimization objective. So we had to take a quick, uh, careful look at what parents we were using. So we decided on three parents, the first being the result of the convex optimization portfolio, which we'll have over here. The second was the benchmark, which was our second parent. And the third parent was the previous portfolio. And all of these different parents took into account a different aspect of our new objective function that we had just introduced on the last page. And therefore, by having our genetic algorithm started looking in this area, it would minimize the distance and the likelihood, it would increase the likelihood that we would get to a better expected return and expected result. So some of the mutations that occur in genetic algorithms that we took into account. So the first one is crossing over. And this is uh, taking elements of one portfolio or one parent and switching it over with elements of the other parent or portfolio. So what we did is we switched the weights of 20 swaps between two parents. So for example, this is portfolio one, this is portfolio two, and we have some stocks along that portfolio. I know Google and Apple are on the NASDAQ, not the S&P 500, but this is for an example. So on portfolio one, Google has a weight of 1%, and on portfolio two, Google has a weight of 2%. So for crossing over, what we do is we switch those weights simply, and now portfolio one, well, Google will have a weight of 2%, and on portfolio two, Google will have a weight of 1%. And then we normalize the portfolio so we weren't uh, shorting and we were within the, that constraint of W equals 1. As well, the second mutation that occurs is point mutation. So this is a mutation that is independent in and of itself. And we change the weights of 20 stocks. Now, we didn't just let these mutations happen randomly. We kind of built a constraint into them so they wouldn't, again, go off in that space where we don't want it to look. So we had the mutation look within these four constraints. And we chose these four because they were the most easy to implement computationally uh, from a computer science standpoint. And as well, we saw that they really eliminated most of the white space outside of the constraints over here. And what's nice about our algorithm is that, again, this, uh, the 20 stocks can be changed. So here, the, the mutation, the number of stocks mutating can be changed. As well, in the previous slide, the number of crossing over pairs can be changed. So if principal or anybody would like to explore the problem space a little bit more and go off on some tangents, they can do that. And as well, the probability of the mutation can be changed as well. So we also incorporated some text mining. And we worked closely with the professor at Hebrew University, Ronan Feldman. He's published a number of papers through Informs. And he has a company called Amenity Analytics. So we try to perhaps improve upon the alphas that we were given. So what text mining does is it looks at the quarterly reports of stocks, and it counts. It produces a score based on the number of positive and negative statements within the quarterly statements, and it does this for a certain amount of topics within the quarterly reports. And what's nice is that it takes into account forward-looking statements. So instead of simply just looking at standard deviations and historical returns, it kind of gives us a qualitative look at what might happen in the future. So here we have an example from Amgen, which is on the S&P 500. And in 2011, they said that they were going to increase our dividend next quarter, which means, of course, they have cash on hand. Uh, they can return it to the shareholders. And it's a positive statement. Uh, if you want an example of a negative statement, I would just forward you to any of GE's, anything of them from the past year, which I hope Principal hasn't invested in too heavily. Otherwise, don't penalize us for that comment. OK, anyways, text mining. So this is the score, number of positive statements, number of negative statements. It gives us a number between negative 1 and 1. And the way we incorporated it is that we replaced the alpha that we were given with this text mining score. 
And our alpha was actually the delta between one quarter score and the next quarter score. And that's what we used. And we did this for 170 stocks on a quarterly basis. The other stocks that we did not have scores for, we kept the alpha that we were given. I kind of wish that the women I go on dates with had text mining so they could understand my jokes, but one day we'll get there. OK, so what did we come up with? So again, as we said at the beginning, we were able to achieve a return of 25% above the S&P 500 with a higher shape ra sharp ratio with original alphas and as well using our text mining. So taking a closer look, we can see here when lambda is 0, this was our 25% with a lower standard deviation than the benchmark, giving us that higher sharp ratio. And for lambda 10, we were unable to beat the benchmark. Uh, Unfortunately, it just shows you how difficult it is to predict the future. To kind of test how our genetic algorithm was behaving, we wanted to see what industries we were working in to see really if low and lambda was zero, if we were being conservative investors. And indeed, we see here that we're investing in rather inelastic industries, which would not be affected by macroeconomic concerns. Using the text mining alphas, we were able to beat the benchmark by 17%, again, with a lower standard deviation, therefore a higher sharp ratio which is nice to see that our algorithm was able to take into account the text mining and that the text mining did work. In terms of, oh right, okay, so these are the results that we gave to you in the results, the paper that we presented two months ago. But again, because there's this random element, we wanted to make sure that what we were giving you was not random. It wasn't a one-off chance that we beat the S&P 500. So each running of the algorithm takes seven and a half hours. And we were able, we couldn't do it thousands of times for, unfortunately, very robust statistics, but we were able to run it 25 times. And what we saw is that here is the S&P 500. This is the sharp line. So for 80% of the cases, we were able to have a higher sharp ratio than the benchmark, again, justifying the risk that we took. So we weren't always necessarily had a higher return than the benchmark, but we were able to beat it on the risk-adjusted basis. And as well, we wanted to see if our algorithm was operating within the constraints. And what we can see here is that in every single case, the algorithm was operating within all the constraints that we were given to in the problem. So in terms of going forward with our algorithm, there are a few steps that we'd like to take. The first is that we'd like to incorporate the work that principal has done with the work that our professor, Ronan Feldman, and his company has done. So I always think that two heads are better than one, especially one of them is mine. So we'd like to incorporate both of those alphas as well. We mentioned that we only use 170 of the stocks for the text analysis, so we'd like to use it for all 500. And as well, we'd like to increase the efficiency of multi-core processing. So Alex, our computer scientist, he actually burnt his hard drive running our algorithm. So if we can win, we could buy him a new computer. And as well, he can have more opportunity to, um, again, use two, four, perhaps even eight cores going forward. So that includes, concludes our presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to ask, and we can open up the floor to our other uh, participants as well. I just, again, thank you very much. It's been an honor to be here, and hopefully you'll get the opportunity again to meet them at the networking event a little bit later.